Father, we just thank you for tonight, Lord. We thank you that you're such an awesome God, Lord, that you love us the way you do. And as we're going to see tonight, that you love us even though we fall short. I pray that you would uh, speak through me, Lord, that you would empty me out, fill me with your spirit, get your word out to the people, Lord, they're dying to hear it. And I just pray that you just use me as a vessel for you, Lord. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I can't see a thing. There we go. So, the nation of Israel was God's people. They were God's unique people, his nation. To use the vernacular of today, you might say they were one nation under God. They had the freedom of having a unique covenant with God and walking with God from the wilderness after being delivered from Egypt, marching across the Jordan River into a land that was uniquely theirs that God gave them to inhabit, to be able to settle in it, raise their families in it, and worship God in it. But they left that. They strayed from that. They disobeyed the Lord, even as Joshua had indicated that they probably would do. The very last part of the book of Joshua, in the 24th chapter, in verse 14, Joshua tells them, Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served, on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And they kept saying, oh, we'll, we'll serve the Lord. We'll serve the Lord. They tell Joshua in verse 21 of the same chapter, and the people said, no, but we will serve the Lord. So Joshua basically says, look, you've got one of two choices. You keep saying you're going to serve the Lord. If you do then turn away or get rid of all those false things and false gods and goddesses that you and your forefathers worshipped and served the Lord. As a matter of fact, he says back in 20, uh, 24, 15, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. Made no bones about it. But Joshua indicated, he intimated that they would have a tendency to want to go back, which is exactly where we are taken in this story. The book of Judges is a period of history between the entrance of the land under Joshua and the monarchy of Saul, David, and Solomon. It's a period of about 350 to 400 years, and during that period there was no central leadership. There wasn't a Moses, and there wasn't a Joshua. It had reverted back to tribalism, the 12 tribes of Israel with all kinds of trying to settle and manage their own estates in this land. So during that period where it was up and down, God raises 13 judges. Now don't think of a judge sitting behind a bench in a black robe with gavel in hand. It's not that kind of judge. Take out the legal parlance and out of that kind of an idea and think more in terms of them being deliverers. These are judges, but let's call them champions, sometimes political and often military. God raises them up and uses them to deliver the children of Israel out of a very specific local problem. There are 13 judges mentioned in this book, and 12 of them are men. One of them is a very strong and very cool woman by the name of Deborah. And we'll meet her in chapters 4 and 5. Now I have to warn you, this book is rated R. It's rated R for raunchy, for rebellious, and for recalcitrant. 
They were unwilling to obey rules or follow instruction. And there is material in this book that makes us want to blush and become un uncomfortable. It's disturbing. By the time we get to chapter 19 and we get the story of the Levite and the concubine and how he cuts her up in pieces and sends a piece to each of the different tribes, it's like, this is the Bible? Sounds more like a Stephen King novel to me. So here's the warning. It's at a very low moral period in their history, a period of anarchy, which makes the book of Judges very contemporary. And we'll get into some more of that later on. Now, I found a little piece from a historian, a Scottish historian by the name of Alexander Teitler, who lived in the 1700s. And he wrote this, the average age of the world's great civilizations is 200 years. All travel through the same sequence from bondage to spiritual faith, from spiritual faith to great courage, from great courage to liberty, from liberty to abundance, from abundance to leisure, from leisure to selfishness, from selfishness to complacency, from complacency to apathy, from apathy to dependence, from dependence to weakness, and then they circle right back around to bondage again. It's quite a trip. According to his words, and another little article I was reading, the final stage in the demise of a culture is political anarchy. Again, I say it's very contemporary. And as we see in that book of Judges, we'll get the following haunting phrase toward the end of the book. In fact, it's in chapter 21, verse 25, where it says, in those days, there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. They just sort of made up their own rules as they went along. Everyone does what is right in their own eyes. So the theme of the book of Judges is from conquest to compromise. They conquered the land. Joshua led them into it. They sort of settled it, but not completely. They didn't possess their possession. They didn't really take it. They still allowed enemies to come and populate it and, and, become, and become a problem. The tribe of Dan, as a matter of fact, didn't even take any of their territory. They just hid in the mountains till later on. When we get to chapter 18, we'll see that they scurry from the allotment that God gave them down south all the way up north. In this day of pluralism, when society contains people of opposing beliefs and lifestyles, it's easy to get confused and start thinking that tolerance is the same as approval. It isn't. In a democracy, the law gives people the freedom to worship as they please. And I must exercise patience and tolerance with those who believe and practice things that I feel has con God has condemned in this world. The church today doesn't wield the sword like it used to, and therefore it has no authority to eliminate people who disagree with the Christian faith. Romans 13 verses 3 and 4 says, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be afraid of authority? Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Now back in chapter 1, in verse 1, 
It says, now after the death of Joshua, and let me pause here for a second because this is how the book of Joshua opens up as well. It says in Joshua 1.1, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving them, the children of Israel. And then we're introduced to Joshua in that book. So here it's the same name, a different name, I mean, but the same intro. So here we are in the book of Judges. It says in chapter 1, verse 1, now after the death of Joshua, and there's no one. There's no strong successor that will follow Joshua. And there won't be until we get to the monarchy written about in the book of Samuel with King Saul, then King David, and then King Solomon. That being said, we look at chapter 2, verse 1. And it says, Then the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum, And said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Now notice this. It's not an angel of the Lord. It's the definite article, the. And the word angel is capitalized in your Bible, if you'll notice that as well. That means that we need to give it commentary or opinion or at least meditate on that. It's because the translator, translators are identifying the angel of the Lord with the Lord himself. So follow me. So the angel of the Lord says this, back to verse 1. I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land, but you shall tear down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Or it could be translated, what have you done? Therefore, verse 3, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be thorns in your side, and their God shall be a snare to you. Now in Numbers chapter 33, 55, it says the same thing, only 40 years earlier. It reads, but if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land, those you allow to remain will become barbs in your eyes and thorns in your sides. They will give you trouble in the land where you will live. Like I said, Numbers was This passage in Numbers was about 40 years old. It was written during the trek from Egypt to the Promised Land. And that book ends with the new generation of Israelites in the plains of Moab, ready for the crossing of the Jordan River. Verse 4, So it was when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the children of Israel that the people lifted up their voices and wept. Now, the angel of the Lord, I believe, is what theologians call a theophany or a Christophany. It's an appearance of Jesus Christ before his incarnation. Whenever we read of the angel of the Lord in the book of Genesis, for example, and even a couple of times in this book, the language that the angel of the Lord uses is the language that only God himself can use. He says, I delivered you. I'm the one who did this. So here's a messenger that's with the word angel, which means a messenger of God. But the messenger of God says, I'm the one who did it. I'm the one who delivered you. So we're forced to make an interpretation. Who then is this angel of the Lord. 
Well, it's the same as in Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 to 3, when three visitors came to Abraham. It says, Then the Lord appeared to him, Abraham, by the tabernacle trees of Marmara, as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. And we find out later that two of them were angels, and one of them was the Lord himself. And they were in human form. It's the same in the book of Joshua in chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. It says, and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or are you for our adversaries? I think he was really hoping he was for him. That was the same angel of the Lord that was at the burning bush. Moses was tending his father-in-law's flock at Horeb, the mountain of God. In Exodus 3, verse 2, it says, There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within the bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. The bush spoke. It was an apparition. It speaks of the Lord's angel the angel of the Lord speaking to him there from the burning bush. So that's why I believe it's a pre-incarnate form of Jesus in the Old Testament. It is the Lord himself showing up. So if you ever wonder where Jesus is in the Old Testament, many scholars will point to this Christophany or Theophany. This is one of them in verses 1 through 4. But notice what the people do after the angel of the Lord says this. It says in verse 4, they lifted up their voices and wept. They got all emotional. And in verse 5, they said they called the, they called the name of that place Bochim, which means weepers. And they sacrificed there to the Lord. So that sounds pretty promising to me. They cried. They wept. Oh, how they cried. They had a deep emotional experience and a wonderful worship, I'm, I'm thinking, as well. But they did nothing to change their behavior. They'll leave the worship service. They'll leave their emotional experience. And they will not trust the Lord. They will not take the land. They will revert to disobedience. And the rest of this book, from this point on, shows how it goes from bad to worse. Now, oftentimes, when the Lord deals with us, when the Lord deals with a person over an issue, it can become a very emotional thing. Believe me, I know. You know, we feel it to the core, and a person will weep and cry and go, what just happened? Well, the Lord touched me, you might say. Did you change? Well, no, I'm still doing the same behavior. But boy, did I have a good cry. Sometimes we can weep away the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And you just get satisfied with having an emotional experience with no heart change with not putting into practice the principles that change your behavior. And that's what the Lord is after. That's what he's looking for. In the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 13, it says, So rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is a gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. And he relents from doing harm. So you rend or tear 
or rip your heart out. You get changed deep down inside. How many times in the Bible do we read of someone hearing bad news or something happens to cause them to mourn or whatever? How many times do we read that they or he tore their clothes? Job chapter 1, verse 20. Job chapter 2, verse 12. Esther chapter 4, verse 1. Ezra 9, 5. 2 Chronicles 23, 13. 2 Kings 11, 14. 2 Kings 22, 11. 2 Kings 34, 19. And we read in 1 Kings chapter 21, verses 20 through 28, that Ahab, a king of Israel, tore his clothes and put on sackcloth when he learned that God planned to punish him and everyone he loved. These are just a few examples. I was curious to find out how many times in the Bible torn clothes was mentioned. The most reliable source that I found was the Dictionary of Bible Themes. It says there are 5,188 references to tearing clothes. I don't know about that. It seems rather excessive to me, but that's what they said. Even though it is and was an ancient Jewish practice of sorrow or mourning that goes all the way back to Genesis 37, verse 29, when Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. So, in this case, rend your heart, not your garments. Verse 6, when Joshua dismissed the people, the children of Israel went each to his own inheritance to possess the land. So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen the great works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old. That's a long time. I should live so long. And they buried him within the door of his within the border of his inheritance at Timnath Harris, in the mountains of Ephraim, in the northwest side of Mount Gaash. When all the generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. This entire passage is a repetition of Joshua 24, verses 29 to 31, which reads almost word for word, After these things Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath Sarah, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gaash. Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. Now, it was inserted here in Judges just to give the reader the reasons which called forth so strong and severe a rebuke, a rebuke from the angel of the Lord. During the lifetime of the first occupiers of the first generation, you might say, who retained a vivid recollection of all the miracles and judgments which they had witnessed in Egypt and in the desert. The national character stood high in their faith in the Lord. But in the course of time, a new generation arose who were strangers to all the hallowed and solemnizing experiences of their fathers, and too readily they yielded to the corrupting influences of idolatry that surrounded them. George Orwell wrote, who controls, the, who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. Once they got in control of the present, both Hitler and Stalin rewrote past history so they could control the future events. 
And for a time, it worked. Now remember I said earlier, this is the end of a strong central leadership. There was Abraham, there was Isaac, there was Jacob, and then there was Joseph that the Lord raised up. Then they went into Egypt where the Lord raised up Moses. And after Moses, Joshua. And after Joshua, well, you get about 400 years of floundering. And now the author of this book, who, as Bill said last week, and I also believe is Samuel, in the verses that follow in chapter 2, he gives a summary of, summary of what I call a sin cycle. Not spin cycle, sin cycle. There are four cycles of behavior that take us downward. It's like they served the Lord while Joshua was alive and while those elders were alive who experienced what, that firsthand experience of greatness with God in the wilderness and the crossing of the Jordan. But once that generation passed away, the next generation didn't follow. And they do it seven times in this book. It's an interesting thing. Revival rarely makes it into the next generation, unless those children themselves have their own personal relationship with the Lord. You can never live off what your parents went through and saw and did. You have to have your own experience. Miles Toulman, the ex executive director of Alpha Asia Pacific Anglican Church, said, and I quote, Christianity is always one generation away from extinction. So did Lord Carey, the Archbishop of Canterbury. And so did Henry M. Morris, a Christian apologist who lived from 1918 to 2006. And we see this all the time. Children are raised in the church, then they go to college. And, you know, all they got there to strengthen their faith was maybe a couple of youth group jubilees, but not much to help them in that area. But then they get into the radical thinking environment of the college, and they walk away from their faith. So it's incumbent upon the older generation, us, as best we can to live it and to pass it down to the next generation. Now, of course, there are exceptions. Young people stay strong in the Lord in the face of radical teachings. They are well grounded and strong in their faith. And this is because their parents and even their grandparents and probably some aunts and uncles were consistent in raising their children in a godly environment. But the sin cycle is like this. Rebellion, that's the first phase. After rebellion comes retribution. God allows them to suffer at the hand of their enemies. They become enslaved by the enemies whose gods they worship to begin with because they were tired of following the Lord. Then there's repentance. They call out. They weep. They say, oh God, please forgive us. And then there's restoration. God hears them. He sends them a judge, a champion, a deliverer who delivers them, and again, they're back on top with God. And then it goes all through the same cycle again. Seven times it's outlined in this book with different judges. So when all that generation had been gathered to the fathers and another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel, that's verse 10. In verse 11 it goes on, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. I'll explain next week who they are. And they forsook the Lord of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt and they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them. And they bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. 
they forsook the Lord and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. And again, I'll explain who they are later, probably next week. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. So he delivered them into the hands of plunderers who despoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies all around so they could no longer stand before their enemies. This is the second phase of that cycle, retribution. Wherever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for calamity, as the Lord had said and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were greatly distressed. When they went out to fight their enemies, Israel was defeated because the Lord wasn't with them. And this is what Moses had said would happen in Deuteronomy 28, verses 25 and 26. He says, The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them, and you shall become troublesome to all the kingdoms of the earth. Your carcasses shall be for food for all of the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and no one shall frighten them away. So after that comes repentance and then restoration. It says in verse 16, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but they played the harlot with other gods. They bowed down to them. They turned quickly from the way in which their fathers walked to obeying the commandments of the Lord. They did not do so. And when the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because those who oppressed them had harassed them. And when it came to pass, when the judge was dead, that they reverted and behaved more correctly correctly than their fathers by following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. They did not cease from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way. Then the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he said, because this nation has transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers and has not heeded my voice, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died, so that through them I may test Israel whether they will keep the ways of the Lord to walk in them as their fathers kept them or not. Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out immediately, nor did he deliver them into the hand of Joshua. Whenever Israel turned away from the Lord to worship idols, he chastened them severely. And when in their misery they turned back to him, he liberated them. But just as soon as they were free and their situation was comfortable again, Israel went right back into the same old sins. Isn't that the way we act sometimes? We're walking with the Lord, and we get very comfortable, and then we get complacent, and the enemy or our flesh tempts us, and we say, well, I've been a good boy. It'll be okay this one time. Next thing you know, you're really out there. I don't know about you, but this happens more often to me than I would like. The people of Israel did the same thing. They wasted their suffering. They didn't learn the lessons God wanted them to learn and profit from his chastenings. Last week we said that originally the map of the land that God granted to Israel was about 300,000 square miles. 
and that at their peak under King David and Solomon, they only occupied about 30 square miles. Let me have that first map. So there's Josh, and there's all the ites all around. And you see right there in the middle of the red lettering, that's where they camped before they crossed over the Jordan. The next one. This is a map of Israel. The purple is Saul's kingdom. The green area, including the purple, was David's kingdom. And the entire area outlined in red, including the yellow up there, was Solomon's kingdom. I just thought that was interesting. And we're talking about all those guys, so that's what they were dealing with. So at their peak with David and Solomon, they only took about a tenth of what God really wanted for them. And that's because they were promised the land and they conquered the land, but they never occupied the land. They didn't possess their possessions. So the corollary here is this. We are given the Bible the entire Bible, the Old and the New Testament. And in that Bible, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. I am convinced there is so much more God wants us to experience than we are presently experiencing. I know that to be true for me. You might say, well, what's the problem? He's blessing us. The problem is often we let, it, we let the enemy and more often the flesh dwell in our land. The flesh is determined. The weaknesses the habits, the old ways of doing things rear their ugly heads. We make excuses for them. Oh, I'll just tolerate them. But look, I'm hot-headed. I'm combative. I'm argumentative. That's just who I am. You don't like it? Tough. But if you start making those kind of excuses... You're simply saying, I will tolerate the propensities, the proclivities, and the weaknesses of my flesh. And by doing so, allow it to take root and to flourish. God wants you to live not by the flesh, but in the spirit to conquer those propensities, proclivities, and the weaknesses of your flesh. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17 tells us, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. You and I are to be more than conquerors of our land. We are also to be occupiers. We occupy this body God gave us. Romans 12.1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And so that's why I say the book of Judges will prove to be very contemporary. But looks like we're out of time. We're close to it. Can't see that far away. Yeah, we're out of time. So we'll save this for the next time. Let's pray. Father, we come to you tonight, Lord. We, uh, we know we fall short. We know that you pick us up and dust us off every single time. You love us, Lord. We try not to sin. We try not to uh, lose favor in your eyes, Lord, but uh, we're humans, and we sin, and we know it. And we have, have nothing but to come to you in a repentant heart and just say, Father, forgive me. 
I pray that that would ring true for everybody, Lord. Go before the rest of our week. Be with us this weekend in service on Sunday. And I pray that you would uh, just bless each and every person here. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.